but that is consistency. A consistent clean barrel every time you squeeze the trigger means consistent muzzle velocity, which means consistent downrange accuracy. Well, it's just a, it's just a, uh, I guess, um, I guess a testament to the man upstairs has a plan for me and you, uh, and everybody listening to this podcast right now. But when you're in the moment, you might not see that plan. And looking back now over my life of being in being in the hunting industry, and even prior to that, being in some wayward situation, there was a plan. It just took forty something years to see it. So I've been asked before, what is my favorite weapon to hunt whitetails with? And usually my answer lies somewhere along the lines of whatever's in season. Basically, whatever is in season, whatever is legal for me to use to go out and be able to hunt deer is the choice I'm going to go with. All right, so typically in my mind, I have those weapons categorized as archery weapons and rifle as in like centerfire rifles. And admittedly, there hasn't been a whole lot of emphasis in my own personal hunting journey on muzzle letters. Well, of course, after this conversation that I had with Tony Smotherman, that has experienced a complete 180. In the past, I didn't really know a whole lot about muzzle letters, and I probably still don't know a whole lot now. But after being able to sit down and chat with Tony for about an hour, my respect for muzzle letters has grown exponentially. So as hunters, we of course love new challenges and we love the pursuit of being able to better ourselves and be able to make us better hunters and being able to open ourselves up to new things, including hunting with a muzzleloader is one of those things that many of us have had the opportunity to do and just really didn't know it. So my guest today is Tony Smotherman. So Tony, he is a representative from CVA. CVA, of course, makes some of the world's best muzzleloader rifles. And his knowledge of muzzleloaders and his knowledge of hunting and his knowledge of just really the outdoor lifestyle and his respect for all those things is something that is certainly worthy of respect. So I had a really fun conversation with Tony. He is a very busy guy and he's a guy that he's got a lot of different things going on in his life from, of course, hunting to traveling to giving presentations for CVA and I'm so thankful that we were able to get this conversation scheduled and be able to have him on the Rice Kelly podcast. Before I get to my conversation with Tony, I just want to ask you guys if you would connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, you can find me at facebook.com slash RKE a field. So that's RKE as in Rice Kill Eat a field. That's facebook.com slash RKE a field. And then also I'm on Instagram at the handle at rice kill eat. So go ahead and follow me there. Be sure to connect with me on those social media outlets. And also if you guys are interested in learning more about CVA and learning more about muzzle loaders, then be sure to check out the show notes that are in the bottom of this episode down there. I include all kinds of resources for you guys that may be interested in whatever topic was discussed during the, the episode. Be sure to check out those resources. We've got all kinds of links for CVA, and I, of course, have links to connect with Tony. So I'm really excited to be able to share this episode with you guys. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into my conversation with Tony Smotherman of CVA. Oh, yeah, I think we are ready to rock. So I'm sitting here with Tony Smotherman. Thank you so much, Tony, for being on. I know... Right now, your work schedule is kind of crazy, and, you know, we were talking a little bit before. You got some plans coming up, you know, tomorrow, actually, but that, that's I appreciate you taking some time this evening to come on the Rice Killy podcast with me. Man, i tell you, I appreciate the opportunity, and I, I appreciate what you're doing to keep the outdoors alive across this great country. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely my pleasure. That's, that's something that, you know, right now with this crazy world that we live in, that's something that seems to be... You know, kind of a reoccurring trend for guys like you and me who love to get outside. It's just we, you know, we want to come together and we want to talk about it because it's it's something that I guess kind of brings us peace. It's something that, you know, we all kind of have, have in common and it kind of takes us away from the craziness right now. <laughs> you bet. And, man, if we're outside, we ain't got to worry about getting this uh, COVID-19 business because uh, we're socially distant all the time. You know, when we're on the farm working or hanging tree stands, which is kind of what we're doing now, or some fall prop uh, plot prep um we're not around anybody so actually works out pretty good timing 
Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Whenever they came out in March and said to start socially distancing and, you know, staying away from people, I was like, jackpot. That sounds great to me. Let's, let's go out in the woods. <laughs> I was planning on doing that anyways. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I first uh, heard your presentation on uh, CVA products at the Buck Ventures Pro Staff meeting just a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I had to reach out to you, of course, to get you on the Rise Click podcast because the you really educated me on muzzle loaders and, you know, obviously with CVA products in general. And, um, you know, I'm, I appreciate you being on and just that, that Buck Ventures meeting was just incredible. This is my first year going and it was, it was cool to be, you know, in a, in a room with a bunch of people who love God and who love to hunt. And it was, it was really cool. Well, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm glad you made it out there for the first time this year. Um, myself personally, that it's my second trip out there to the, Buck Ventures Pro Staff get together, but uh, maybe a little bit of a back history. Um, I've known Jeff uh, and Daniel for a long, long time uh, and have uh, been friends and or partners with them uh, from pretty much their first time uh, working towards their goal of Buck Ventures. Um, and last year I was there, obviously CBA, uh, the company I work for, uh, is uh, a sponsor of Buck Ventures and, and had the opportunity to come out there last year and and educate some of their pro staff on our product and who we are and what we do and and new products and all that kind of good stuff and so when i was there of course quick business fly in fly out um i only planned a day and a half of time to be there at that event and and when i left uh, i personally did not want to leave uh and also as a company cba i did not want to leave because that um, uh, that event was probably the most amazing event I had been to in a very long time. Um, and, and the whole room was leaders or eagles, as I like to say, you know, I, I was always told from, from a very young man, if you want to be an eagle in life, you hang out with eagles. And if you want to be a turkey in life, you hang out with turkeys. Um, <laughs> and that room was full of eagles, man. And, and this year as well, too, when you guys were there. Yeah, it was definitely a, a an incredible experience for me. I, you know, I, I honestly I went into the weekend not really knowing what to expect, but you know, I'm and I almost got cold feet prior to just because I didn't really know what to what to really expect from it. But I'm so glad I went, and I'm already looking forward to heading out to Oklahoma next year for that same event. Well, when the event was over with, well, let me tell you about when I left there last year early uh, before the event was over with. The first phone call I made on the road back to the airport was to our CBA office and said I had made a grave mistake. I left before the event was over, and I said I will not do that again for 2020. This year, I had full intentions of being there for the full entire time and get to take part in that because, like you said, it was it was pretty amazing. And I know to to jump into an event like the Buck Ventures event there, uh, it, it does take some effort on everybody's behalf to, to dedicate three or four days to flying or driving across the country. Uh, this year, even more because of the, some of the travel restrictions. But it took a lot of dedication for folks to be there. And like you said, you, you had maybe just a touch of cold feet. But once you get there, you realize that the Buck Ventures crew is a family and you're part of that family when you leave. So pretty amazing event. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a family. I mean, and that's the atmosphere that they have there. I mean, it's just everybody, as soon as you really, literally before you even walk in the door, like you're, there's people out there meeting you greeting you, shaking hands, hugging you and, you know, just wanting to get to know you, getting to know, you know, how was your trip and that kind of thing. And, you know, it, it was, it was really cool. And it was, you know, that whole group, I'm, I'm excited to be able to continue to, you know, work with them in the, in the future, being a pro staff now. And it's, I definitely think God put them in my life for that purpose. And I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, where the, where the future kind of holds with them. But you were saying that you are, you've been with CVA for a while. So what is your position with CVA? Uh, so it's a, it's a very great question, man. And my position is a, a pretty hoity toity title. Uh, and it took me a long time to really figure out what it meant. Uh, my title <laughs> at CVA is head of influencer relations. Um, you know, and, and a bit of my back history, uh, I've been in the hunting industry for 25 years or so. Um, well, I, I kind of got in when I was around 19 or 20, and I started out as, as just a typical pro staff for a couple country, or countries, a couple companies, um, 
and then worked my way into being an outdoor writer, uh, worked into being a magazine owner. I end up owning my largest uh, publication here in the state of Tennessee called Tennessee Outdoor News. Um, and then from there, I went into writing safety instructional DVDs for a muzzleloader company there into television. Um, and the last TV show that I hosted was my own show called Traveling Hunter, which was on the Sportsman's Channel uh, on Sunday nights for quite a long time. And uh, I do not do that now. Uh, my, my dad, unfortunately, got terribly sick and uh, needed 24-hour care for quite a bit of time. And, and I basically stopped all my TV endeavors uh, to take care of my dad till he, till, till he left us here. Uh, but since then, um, I have been working for CVA and I handle everybody that's in the media world, which really makes it easy because I've kind of been on the other side because I've been the pro staffer, the outdoor writer, uh, the magazine owner or publisher, uh, the TV show host. Uh, and now through the head of influencer relations here at the CBA brand, I get to take care of everybody uh, in every position that I used to be in. So it's, it's pretty easy transition. Yeah, that's great. That's that's something that you had mentioned during your presentation there at the Buck Ventures Pro Staff meeting was that, you know, a lot of your early work was done in, you know, in the, in the outdoor industry and you were doing some outdoor writing. And, and I thought it was interesting that you had got into outdoor writing, but, you know, you were saying something about how you know, English in school wasn't wasn't exactly your your top notch subject. But I thought that was hilarious. And but I think it's just, you know, a testament to to say that you know, pretty much if anybody is passionate about something, you know, they have opportunities and if they, you know, work hard at it well enough, then they have opportunities to be able to, you know, pursue something and be able to do something for, uh, I mean, at least a little bit, it could, you know, be a stepping stone or it could be, you know, open up another door to where you could be doing something, you know, kind of like what you're doing right now with CVA. You know, one thing that I, I kind of learned early on, um, that if you want to do something bad enough, if you want to put the time into your goals, you can accomplish those goals because the only person that stands in your way of reaching those goals is you. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, I, I, I knew that I wanted to be in the outdoor industry um, even through my teenage years because earlier on in my teenage life there, uh, I guess as a lot of other teenagers, things got a little sideways um, when you got introduced into girls and, and oh, yeah. I, uh, experienced some, a little bit of alcohol abuse that, that got me in some wavered positions. And, and I was hanging around turkeys at that time and, and, and was really dragging me in a direction that, that, um, uh, well, at the end of the day, I should not have been in that position. And thankfully somebody introduced me to the sport of archery, which, uh, my life is, is hunting with a muzzleloader now, but archery is kind of how I, I got my new direction in life. Uh, through 16, 17 years of age, I guess, at that time, and uh, quickly realized that the outdoors saved me from going down a very wrong path. Uh, so I knew at 18, 19, 20 years old, I wanted to be in the hunting industry. And I, I really didn't know at that time, of course, this really just dates the heck out of me, but I really didn't know at the time there was even a job per se, or it was a job or a career uh, to be in the hunting industry uh, per se, like we know today. Um, and I, the only way that I knew to be able to communicate to the world how great the outdoors is, how the outdoors saved my life, uh, in essence, was to be an outdoor writer. Yeah. Um, and yes, English was a terrible subject of mine. I literally barely passed or graduated high school because of that darn subject called English. <laughs> but I knew that I knew what I wanted to do. And so I started picking up publications like North American Whitetail, the Buckmasters publication, Deer and Deer Hunting, and just reading them from front to back, back to front, end over end um, for years till I started to understand there was an art to be an outdoor writer and to be able to tell a story. Um, and just me self-teaching myself, reading all the greats, uh, the Gordon Whittingtons, um, the Bob Robbs, uh, uh, Charles Alzheimer, uh, uh, um, I maybe butchered his last name before the gentleman's not with us anymore, but he was editor for, for bow hunting magazine. Um, and I read these guys and read these guys till I just finally picked up the trade, uh, which turned into being uh, an outdoor writer and then also into owning and publishing the largest magazine here in the state of Tennessee for 10 years. So uh, just proves if you want to do something bad enough, you'll figure out a way to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a really good point. And that's something that, you know, I see a lot with teenagers now. And it's something that, you know, whenever anybody who's been successful at, at any level in their life, you kind of, kind of hear those stories of going through adversity. You know, that you hear those, those stories of looking for the next mission, you know, it's for somebody, it may be sports, it may be basketball, football, it may be, you know, music, uh, it could be writing, it could be, I mean, there's, the list goes on and on, it could be mixed martial arts, but the, the list goes on and on. And, you know, I think it's important for teenagers to find something that they're really passionate about and something that they want to get good at, you know, some kind of discipline that's going to challenge them. It's going to force them to learn some, not just teenagers. I mean, it, that, that definitely applies to really just about anybody at any age. You I mean, bet it find does. some, yeah, absolutely. Find something that is going to discipline somebody or discipline you and challenge you and force you to learn something new in order to get good at it. And eventually, you know, ideally you eventually get good enough at it to where you could really start to teach other people and you can, you know, maybe monetize it in a way to where you create your own brand or your own, you know, like in your case, a publication or something like that. That's a, that's really inspiring. That's a really cool story that you got. Well, it's just, it's just, a, uh, I guess, um, I guess a testament to the man upstairs has a plan for me and you uh, and everybody listening to this podcast right now. But when you're in the moment, you might not see that plan. And looking back now over my life of being in the, being in the hunting industry and even prior to that being in some wayward situations, there was a plan it just took 40 something years to see it yeah absolutely definitely definitely so what kind of brings you up to to date right now i mean we were talking before we pushed the record button and of course you're a farmer i mean you're obviously working with cva you've had all these different things kind of coming up so coming up to right now i mean what kind of got you into into farming a little bit you know i i guess uh it you know, when I was born, I wasn't born uh, with a silver spoon. My dad was was just an average man. He was a big coon hunter growing up. Um, uh, but I, I was blessed with, with a lot of drive and a lot of ambition. Um, mm -hmm. And and for the last uh, since since about 1999, I, I've been a farm investor um, for the sheer fact of I want to hunt Illinois all the time. Um, especially during the, in the golden triangle years when, when the Pike Brown Adams County area up there were just rocking with big whitetail. I, I wanted to figure out how to be there, um, yeah. and end up just buying farms up there. Um, uh, and kind of got pushed into being a bit of a farmer, if you will, because I had ground that had farming ground on it that need to be farmed to generate, generate revenue. Um, so just kind of got into it just by sheer happenstance, to be honest with you, or, or necessity. Uh, my dad was not a farmer. Uh, growing up here in, in Middle Tennessee, I, I lived just outside of Nashville. And our area is really, uh, it's, it's pretty country, but it's not really known as farming. Um, but I got up there in the Midwest and, and realized how awesome the Midwest was. And for the last 20 years, I, I've invested in farms there, bought and sold farms up there, uh, row cropped my own ground up there. Uh, and then now here in Tennessee, uh, one of the biggest booms across the country is, is hemp farming for, for CBD oil. Um, and uh, my wife is a big believer uh, in not taking uh, big pharmacy drugs, if not, uh, if, if, you know, if, if you don't have to. Um, and we got into uh, producing or uh, growing hemp, producing CBD, CBD products, and that's oils, cream, salves, butters, chapsticks, beard oils, you name it, we produce it. Um, and, and it's basically, it's just kind of to fight big pharmacy and, and keep people off, uh, antidepressants and all the stuff that, that people are taking now to, to cope with just general life. Uh, so we farmed row crops up there and here in Tennessee, we farm hemp. Yeah. You're definitely seeing a lot of the, the issues that come up with big farm right now. If you, if you turn, turn on the news there, you, you're not going to miss a story where you're not talking, you're not seeing something about some kind of medicine you know but I, I yeah that's <laughs> yeah, especially right now but yeah that's um you know i was i'm i guess i'm kind of ignorant to the to the fact that you know hemp you know the whole the whole processing and that kind of thing and you know I, I still to this day don't really know a whole lot about it but you know you kind of see uh a wave 
of this kind of taking place. I live in Kentucky, and you know, there's a lot of people that are kind of taking it up here in Kentucky as well. You bet. There's uh, people in Tennessee. That's a hotbed for it. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, you know, you're, you're seeing it more and more, and you're seeing all kinds of of you know farms popping up and that kind of thing. And you're seeing a lot more of the products in the store. But I mean, it's just one of those things that's just, from my knowledge, it's just another agriculture crop it's something that you know farmers are making money off of because there's a demand for it right now i mean farming is a business so if you have the demand you got to produce the supply that is correct you know and, and the greatest thing about hemp and cbd is number one obviously it's all natural um uh and and the farming that we do here there's no chemical supplied and there's no pesticides or nothing like that so 100 all natural um, and it just takes a place of, of antidepressants and, and Xanaxes and all this stuff that people are on right now. Um, so it's just a, uh, it's a plant that the man upstairs put on this earth. And um, obviously for, it seems like for the last hundred years, it's kind of been outlawed, but we have found a way to bring it back into play again. And it is helping so many people across this country get off stuff that they should not be taking that is absolutely not good for their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That I think we see a lot of the repercussions of that, you know, drug addictions and that kind of thing that are, you know, wrecking families or wrecking people and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's, it's pretty unfortunate to see that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's, it, that's very prevalent right now. And hopefully this, uh, you know, the, C the CBD, the uh, hemp stuff will definitely kind of help kind of, I guess, move that in a different direction. But, you know, for you, how difficult is it to have the farms and, you know, do the job that you do where you're traveling. I know you say you're leaving for Wyoming tomorrow. By the time this publishes, you'll be back by then, but you bet. You know, yeah, man. you've got a lot of traveling and that kind of thing. So how difficult is it to do all that stuff, but also be able to balance, you know, being married and, you know, hunting and all that kind of thing. You know, it's a, it is a pretty difficult balance for sure. Um, uh, you know, my, my nickname and my TV show and, and what I've kind of went by for a long time, even through on my social media handles, is Traveling Hunter. So I have always been a guy that is a mover and a shaker, and I'm, I'm not doing that to stick my chest out, but I've always just been hungry uh, to do more and stay busy and find that next goal and, and try to reach that goal. Um, so through the farming thing, definitely keeps me busy. But in the springtime, once you get everything planted, it, it kind of goes quiet after that. Uh, then we turn into food plot farming, which I have farms here in Tennessee that I totally dedicate to, to whitetail, if you will, production and, and turkey uh, farms, if you will. Um, so we raise corn and beans and, and then, of course, um, work with several different companies as far as uh, annual food plot mixes. Uh, we keep water holes in place, feeders running. So there's a lot of work there too, uh, but it all kind of works together. Um, the only thing that, that really doesn't have a high and a low is my position here with CBA. Um, like I said, everything that I do here for our brand is working with all the magazine owners and writers across the country, all the TV shows that we sponsor, uh, our national pro staff, our local pro staff, uh, everybody that does podcasts, things like that. Uh, so that's a pretty steady, um, well, they don't ever slow down. And th the great thing is, is I don't really ever clock out. I kind of work from what we call can to can't from when I can in the morning till I just can't in the morning at night. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of this stuff I can get done through the middle of the day or if I have to after hours um, up into the evening. Um, so, so it works out pretty good. And of course, a lot of the stuff um, with technology that we have today, just like we're here on this podcast and we're not sitting beside each other. Right. Um, we can do a lot on the computer, uh, and still handle business and take care of everybody that needs to be handled. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have to commend you cause, uh, you know, we've been, we've been trying to get our podcast scheduled, I don't know, maybe for a week or so. And, you know, for me, cause I, I'm a full-time teacher. So like right now it's real slow, it's summertime and, you know, but I know for you, it's, it's, this is hot time for you. I mean, you got all kinds of stuff going on and like I said, you're going to be traveling uh tomorrow and that kind of thing but you know once hunting season kind of starts it, are you able to kind of carve out some time to get out in the tree stand a little bit and being able to get out in the blind and get on the food plot some well that's that is the greatest thing about what i do as uh, as an umbrella if you will everything underneath that umbrella totally rotates around hunting season uh my farming yeah. stuff my food plot stuff typically obviously that's always done uh time hunting season starts uh and again the stuff that i do for our cva brand um a lot of it 
fortunately includes hunting trips, which is awesome. Um, and if it's, if it's not a business trip, uh, where it be a personal trip per se, uh, I still can handle everything obviously via telephone or, or yeah. the computer. So, so it works out pretty good. So we, so we're going to go to Wyoming tomorrow, kind of start looking, uh, doing a, a bit of preseason scouting, if you will, out there for mule deer season, um, which typically opens up around the 1st of October, uh, for the portion of Wyoming that I hunt in. And, uh, once, once October 1st kicks in, it's pretty much nonstop. Uh, till mid January. Yeah. That's awesome. That's good that you're able to kind of get that going. What kind of trail cam picks are you seeing right now there in Tennessee? You got any good bucks rolling in or anything right now? Any enough to make me jealous? <laughs> well, you know, obviously Kentucky, the old bluegrass state you live in there is definitely a, a, a much bigger contender in producing big whitetail versus Tennessee. Uh, but you guys have been under such a uh, amazing buck management. Uh, program for so long uh, i know a lot of people that kind of rubs them the wrong way sometimes with just being able to harvest one buck but yeah. you guys' harvest record proves that that absolutely works for producing great deer um i used to keep up with with all the, the boone and crockett producing states and in the top 10 uh watched it really heavy especially when i own my uh, outdoor publication and in kentucky always come in in the top three or four as the best uh, Boone and Crockett producing state in the country. Um, unfortunately, uh, south here in Tennessee, we haven't had um, the management program like you guys have had for such a long period of time. Uh, most of my young years of growing up chasing deer around this country, we could shoot 13 bucks a year, uh, which doesn't really do a whole lot for really solid age structure, as you could imagine. Yeah. Um, but we're down to two bucks now. We, we kind of uh, some squeaky wheels finally got the grease and and we finally uh pinched it down a little bit we went from 13 to three and now we're down to two uh which is starting to show its hand um i have a dozen trail camera pictures right now that have 140 to 170 inch deer on them here in tennessee that's awesome, so we're that's awesome. Up you guys in kentucky i'm gonna tell you right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's that's better than what I have going on right now. So if that if that makes you feel any better, but yeah, I am. Uh, you know, I always like to brag on our fish and wildlife because I feel like we got some of the best fish and wildlife guys here in Kentucky. You know that you can kind of get a hold of throughout the whole nation, and you know you kind of see that with the with the whitetail population that we have here because a lot of people they do, <clears throat> as you were saying, they kind of get all you know up up in with their with a one buck harvest, but I mean, at the same time, it's going to produce much better quality deer because I mean, you're, you're not killing off every buck every year. So, I mean, you, you see that over and over each year. When we started uh, kind of getting into the management program here in the state of Tennessee, uh, I still owned uh, my outdoor publication there at the time and, and would do surveys continuously about who and who would want the management practice to go into play. Um, how many people would want to shoot a big deer? And it's, it's amazing that you'd have a crowd of a hundred people and they would all be complaining about the buck management program. Oh, you're taking deer away from us. You know, if we're going to go from 13 bucks to three bucks, you're taking away our rights as hunters and blah, 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 blah. But then you would ask that same group of 100 hunters, how many of you guys want to shoot a big deer? And every one of them would break their arm trying to stick their hand up in the air going, <laughs> yeah, I want to shoot a big deer. Um, so it's funny how that, that, um, you know, People want things, but they don't do. They don't want to do what it takes to get to that point. Um, and that's where the DNR or uh, TWRA or um, whatever game association it is, it's in your state, um, has to step in and just kind of put their foot down and say, "Hey, this is what's going to happen." Uh, and at the end of the day, it might be hard to swallow for people, um, but but it's the best at the end of the day because they get to reap the benefits of seeing really big deer. And and I guarantee you, there's. 96 out of 100 people if they sit down and watch a tv show uh that's on one of the networks right now they want to see a big buck hit the dirt yeah yeah definitely that's that's something that uh you know with the season approaching i've been watching a whole lot on our tv and you know got my kids sitting down beside me and my, my son he'll whenever one walks out he'll be like dad i want to get one like that this year <laughs> it's like i do too <laughs> but <laughs> that's the way it be, man that's Good right <laughs> that's awesome but you know uh we kind of talked about how you got started with archery and that kind of thing, but of course you're a muzzleloader guy now, you know, so to speak. So what is it about muzzleloaders that really, you know, what is it about them that, that attracts you so much? 
You know, it was, um, it, it did start out as, as a passion like it is now. Um, it started out as a necessity. Uh, like I said, when I started to, to drift into outdoor riding, I had to have something to write about. Uh, living here in Tennessee at the time, uh, there was no big deer to speak of, um, just because, like I said, our management program was pretty, pretty off kilter there for a long time. So I quickly realized if I wanted to be able to write a hunting article and to gather people's attention long enough for them to read the article, it typically had to rotate around a big deer. And, you know, if you're going to shoot a big deer, you got to shoot them where they live. And if they don't live where you're hunting, you're never going to shoot one. So I, I realized that if I was ever going to shoot a big deer big enough to write an article about for somebody to read, uh, to get my, um, my trade, if you will, of being an outdoor writer started, I had to shoot some big deer and I had to go where they lived, which was the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma. And a lot of those states I just mentioned through the Midwest do not allow center fires, which is what I grew up utilizing here in Tennessee. Uh, so I had to pick up muzzleloading just for the sheer fact of if I was going to hunt where big deer live, I had to use the weapon of choice, and that was a muzzleloader. Uh, not that I didn't want to take a bow up there, but I also didn't want to do catch and release. So that muzzleloader gave me a 100-yard opportunity versus a 40-yard opportunity. So I got into hunting with a muzzleloader just because I needed to get deer in the dirt to be able to write articles about them to pursue my passion, if you will. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a, that's definitely an advantage of course, to muzzle loader. Um, I mean, that's not something I have a whole lot of experience with. I, I shot maybe a muzzle loader is maybe a handful of times, but you know, of course we have a dedicated season here in Kentucky for muzzle loaders, which a lot of States do for white tails. And, um, you know, every, we, we always have ours, I think it's somewhere around the middle of October. And then we have another one at the beginning of December, you know, those, when those weekends that pop up, I'm really jealous of all the people that are out, you know, hunting with muzzle loaders at the, hey, at the time. Hey, you know a guy, man. We can take care of this problem. We can get through <laughs> the timber with a muzzle loader, bro. There um, you go. But that's another reason that, that I kind of got uh, digging into the passion of hunting with a muzzle loader was the fact that there are so many great states out there that have a dedicated muzzle loader or black powder or now considered primitive weapon season. Um, that it just it just seemed smart to me to pick up that that weapon of choice, if you will. Uh, number one, you was the first man in the woods with a bang stick. Uh, typically, the muzzleloader always follows archery season, so I like that advantage. Uh, I like the dedicated seasons, just like you said here in, in or there in your state of Kentucky. Um, I think typically you guys are around October sixteenth, which mm -hmm. is almost at the end where the bucks start becoming not predictable, but a little bit still predictable. And I, I personally uh, feel that the three letter word that everybody talks about the rut is probably the worst time to be able to go in and harvest a big deer. Um, yes, you can absolutely get lucky and be in a tree stand when a hot doe comes by and, and sh smash a giant, no doubt. But at that time of the year, when the rut's going on, it's not a patternable time of year. Um, right. And, and I like to, uh, if I don't bet, but if I was a betting man, I would like to bet when odds are in my favor. And typically the muzzleloader season is really early or really late where animal oil bucks are driven by their stomach and they're coming to common food sources on a daily basis. I like those kind of odds if I'm going to be a better or a gambler. Um, and, and that's why another reason why I picked up the muzzle loaders because the early seasons, uh, like right now, I know guys right now that are getting lined up. Uh, they're tuning in their muzzle loaders as we speak uh, to take part in the Kansas early muzzle loader season. And the early muzzle loader season in Kansas is like September 15th. Wow. Have you, ever, have you ever been to a standing bean field and see 15 bucks in the field? Oh, yeah. And usually taking place in September. Yes, sir. It's oh, the yeah. only time in the world that you can go to a standing bean field and be a pile of bucks in the field. They're all still friends. They're not freaking each other out. They're coming to the same spot every afternoon. And if you have a muzzleloader or you're a muzzleloader hunter, you have that opportunity to take part in that hunt in Kansas. And there is nothing no more special than seeing that. Yeah, that, that sounds hard to beat right there. That's, that's pretty awesome. It is. It definitely is. And, you know, when you get into uh, late season stuff, a lot of people think, ah, oh, you know, the rut's over. Uh, hunting season's about done. Uh, but for guys like myself that do hunt with a black powder gun, it's just begun because after the rut is over, bucks are so run down that they got to come back to food source. 
And if yeah. you have food source on your farms, like the food plots that I've been working on here on my farms, they're going to, if they made it through the rut, they're going to be back on my farm, on my food plots every afternoon. Um, and, and like when you get out into um, Western states like Nebraska, Nebraska has an amazing late season uh, muzzleloader uh, hunt out there. Iowa does the same. And if you get cold weather and you have standing beans and you have a muzzleloader, you're in the hottest seat in the house. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, the the rut, like you were saying, it kind of gets all the attention whenever it comes to white-tailed deer. But, I mean, yes, I, 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 I personally, I love September because you everything's still green. You know, you can, you can kind of get them patterned down, especially to, in the evenings, you know, kind of where they're coming in when they're getting there and that kind of thing. So I love September, but here in uh, Kentucky, we have just archery and we have a little bit of crossbow right at the end of September, but I love September. And then, you know, kind of leading up to the rut in that mid October to end of October range. Cause like you're saying they're they're kind of moving around a little bit, but not a whole lot. And then of course, December, like I think, I think December is one of the most overlooked times of the year to, to hunt for white tailed deer because you know, everybody's probably worn down by then anyways, cause you've yeah. been, you've been getting up at four o'clock in the morning, every morning, November. So by then, you know, December doesn't get a whole bunch of attention, but I've seen some pretty big deer, you know, walking around in December and then, you know, they're still, you know, fairly active cause they're, they're trying to recover from November. And, and again, I think it's the best time in the world to fill a, fill a tag on a big deer. Uh, this last year, uh, we, had built a, a new muzzle loader, which we just introduced here for 2020 under the CVA line called a Paramount Pro. Um, basically the first ever long range bolt action muzzle loader uh, that we've been involved in. And I took it on a tour from Indiana uh, to Iowa and then Missouri late season. I shot 350 inch deer all within about a week and a half. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so it's a bolt action? It is. It is a bolt action. I, our, our world in the CVA line has always been uh, basically break open muzzle loaders. And we've been in the muzzle loading business since 1971. Um, mm -hmm. But but the trend of long range shooting in the center of our world is, is gaining a lot of momentum, a lot of long range shooting competitions across the country. Um, and that precision and long range want from people uh, has now stepped over into the muzzle loading world. And, and was fortunate enough last year to take one of these prototypes that we have uh, on a tour. Uh, and again, late season with a muzzleloader, uh, three really big deer hit the ground in, in a very short period of time because they were driven by their stomach and I had a muzzleloader. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's, that's very interesting. That's something I, I know you had a presenter on at that, uh, at the Buck Ventures Pro Staff meeting. And, you know, the whole mechanism of, of course, muzzleloader, you know, loading it, down the barrel and that kind of thing. So how does that kind of mechanism work for a bolt action rifle or bolt action muzzle loader? You, you know, so, so basically um, when you talk about a muzzle loader um, for rules and regulations across the country, it still has to be loaded by the muzzle. Um, okay. So uh, you still have to pour your powder down the barrel, whether, whether it's pelletized or loose powder, and then push your projectile down on top of your powder. Um, basically, the, the, your ignition source, your primer, uh, is what actually goes into the bolt action. Um, okay. and, and the reason that, that we went into the bolt action side of things is, again, because of the precision world and technology that we live in today, uh, everything is kind of going precision just because we have the technology to do that. Um, and and uh, the centerfire world, people are... Uh, I, I remember when people started talking about shooting a 1,000 yards, it seemed almost impossible. Now, typically any gun that's produced will shoot a thousand yards out of the box with no problem uh, for the sheer fact that we have great optics now. Um, and then our machining capabilities across the gunsmithing world, uh, people can shoot a thousand yards. Um, when I first got into hunting with a muzzleloader, um, I think it was 19 and 92, I believe it was, um, 75 yards was our longest shot and anything mm -hmm. past 75 yards was cliche. You didn't want to talk about it because it, it just was unethical at, the, at that time. Um, this Paramount Pro that we're running now is a 400 yard muzzle loader, guaranteed. Uh, I'm running mine out to 700 yards. Um, and it just comes down to just everything is precision. Um, one thing that um, 
that you'll notice if, if you guys are listening to the podcast now, you'll if you notice or have seen a Paramount or a Paramount Pro, there's one thing missing on the barrel that every muzzleloader has, and that's a ramrod. Um, to make a, a rifle, a long-range precision rifle, the barrel has to be free-floating. Uh, and a muzzleloader with a ramrod touching the barrel in two places and also touching the stock cannot be free-floating. Uh, so we remove the ramrod and have a collapsible ramrod that comes with it. Uh, but basically, we just took everything to the next level and pulled Precision's long-range shooting into this Paramount Pro. So free-floating barrel, uh, bolt action with new ignition system, uh, wicked fast twist rate. Um, I mean, these guns here run about 2,406 feet per second with a 280-grain bullet, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good point that, you know, the, the whole long-range hunting right now especially you know of course out west i mean that's something that it's almost a necessity you know with with certain shots and with certain ranges and that kind of thing you've got to have that range to be able to get it out there and of course you got to have enough weapon behind you to be able to get it out there yeah that's exactly right and, and through the midwest you know a lot of that country up there is is very open and cornfields and bean fields and such and mm -hmm. you know when you we talk about shooting a muzzleloader at 400 yards, that seems like a, a wicked long shot, which it is. Uh, but a lot of those areas up there where these muzzleloader seasons uh, are in play, um, 400 yards is nothing up there in that country. Yeah, that's that's awesome. But uh, So you mentioned that they were it had a free-floating barrel. So how would the, the scope mount onto something like that? You know, if you wanted to install optics or whatever to the rifle, how would it mount to that? So it actually mounts to the receiver um, okay. and your barrel screws into the receiver. So the barrel is free floating. It doesn't touch uh, any place except where it screws into the face of the receiver. And then from there forward, it does not touch the stock. Uh, okay. Ramrod does not touch the barrel and or the stock. Um, so it's, it's kind of based off a Remington 700 platform, um, meaning bolt action style. You have a section of your your action there, and then the barrel screws into that and goes out the front. So, uh, if you look at it, you think it is a bolt action centerfire rifle, but it's actually a muzzleloader. That's awesome. That's great. That's that's really cool that you guys were you know of course able to engineer something like that, and and you don't hear a whole lot about you know long long range muzzleloading shots. I mean that's that's pretty incredible that you guys were able to do that. It's just technology at its best and some really amazing engineers, basically. So what other kind of things is uh, CVA coming out with this fall? I know there's a whole line of cool, you know, rifles and that kind of thing coming out with CVA. What's other, some other stuff that they got coming out? Well, you know, the CVA world is, is always... Um, has always been known as a muzzleloader company. Um, but today, because of the awesome, amazing horsepower that we have and manufacturing capabilities, we have also jumped into the bolt action world of centerfire. Uh, so now we're building uh, a rifle called a Cascade, and we offer 10 different calibers from 243 all the way up to 300 Winchester Magnum. So you got a centerfire coming out. So what's the what's kind of the difference as far as the um, you know the cartridge and that kind of thing for a centerfire versus a uh, muzzleloader? Well, so that's the greatest thing that I think I really do enjoy about a muzzleloader is I'm, my mind is very mechanical. I love working on hot rods and, and building things and stuff like that. Uh, and the muzzleloader basically is a, is a really mechanical device um, to worry that you take different um, components, put it all together to make something happen. Uh, yeah. Take volatized powder or loose powder, the bullet, and then you got an ignition source, which is your primer. In most cases, a 209 shotgun primer uh, or a large rifle primer. Uh, but in the centerfire world, basically, you just take a cartridge that somebody else built, you put it in your action or in the, the centerfire rifle, and, and then you really don't have a lot of mechanics to that. Um, I, I know it gets a lot of great people uh, into the timber uh, and, and on the rifle range, but uh, I think that's the reason I love hunting with a muzzle or so much because I understand the mechanics of it. And, and another reason I think it's great for, uh, I guess, beginners coming into the sport of hunting and or young people uh, because they understand uh, what makes that gun work, if you will, because they get to see the powder, measure the powder, see the bullet by itself, load the bullet, uh, and then see the ignition source, the primer. Um, 
so they really understand the mechanics of it. I think really gain more respect for it. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, opportunity out there in this world for centerfire rifle users and a lot of great seasons out there. Um, so I think that's the reason we kind of jumped into the centerfire market because we were with our manufacturing capabilities and technology today, uh, we was leaving a lot on the table by not having a centerfire in our lineup. Yeah, you got to expand the market a little bit to kind of reach reach a little bit of everybody. Oh, absolutely. So what's a, you know, let's say somebody gets a new muzzle loader this year. They never shot one before or they never really cared for one before. What's something that they need to do, you know, immediately before, of course, taking it out into the woods, you know, they get a new one and what's, what do they do first thing? Oh man, that is, that is a very fine question. Um, <laughs> with, with resources that is available today, uh, I think if a person does not have a mentor uh, that can show them uh, about how to uh, safely use, maintain, and clean a muzzleloader. Uh, there's a lot of videos online about it. Uh, we have produced in-house here several videos how to use and maintain and clean a muzzleloader. Um, so I would highly recommend somebody doing a bit of Google searching on hunting and shooting with a muzzleloader before they just jumped into it, just so they understand the mechanics of it and, and make sure everything is safe. Yeah, that was one thing I was noticing on the, the CVA website is that there's a lot of instructional videos. There's a lot of safety videos. I mean, there's all kinds of things as far as, you know, the, the mechanics of muzzle loading and that kind of thing. And I thought that was really great because, you know, if you got somebody like me who doesn't have a whole lot of experience with, you know, working with muzzle loader, that kind of thing, and you didn't really grow up using them, you know, it, it's, it really is a, it's a science and it's something that, you got to kind of familiarize yourself with before, of course, you get out into the woods and you're trying to fire the projectile at a, at an animal. So there's a lot that goes into it, but I'm looking right here and there's, there's a lot of, I got you on here a couple of times. <laughs> there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of good like instructional videos, you know, for how to use, you know, a muzzle loader, specifically a CVA muzzle loader. And it's, it's something that, you know, watching a few of them was really helpful for me. Well, you know, we, we have a great staff uh, at CVA, man. Our, our media folks, uh, our engineers behind uh, building the brand, building uh, these guns are amazing people. And the last thing we want to do as, as a family, as a company, uh, is to send somebody out there uneducated. So uh, we have spent a lot of time and still currently spending time building new educational videos for people to go to uh, either our website or, of course, now YouTube as well. Um, just so they have a, a proper understanding of the gun that they're going to take to the field. And, and, and that's for number one safety, but also for success. Um, you know, last thing you want to do is go out there and, and your gun not be sighted in properly or, or not cleaned properly and have a hang fire or a misfire. We just don't want you, the end user, to have a failed opportunity uh, just due to lack of knowledge. And, you know, you mentioned care and making sure that you're cleaning that kind of thing, you know, with muzzle loaders, that's something that I really learned a whole lot about, you know, by watching these videos and doing some research, kind of preparing for this was how, pro how important it is to make sure that you're taking care of the muzzle loader and making sure you're keeping it clean. So what, I mean, what throughout the season does somebody need to do to make sure that their their muzzle loader is in working condition making sure that it's staying clean making sure it's not going to you know like you said misfire you know there's uh there it, i guess I'm, I'm, I'm studying for words here just thinking here uh just because there's a ton of thoughts going through my head on that um there's a lot of misconceptions out there about uh, a muzzle loader uh, especially today with with modern technology and modern powders that we have um Years ago, when we used uh, Go-X black powder or Pyrodex, uh, that powder uh, is extremely nasty and dirty. Uh, it has sulfur content in the powder, which makes it uh, very corrosive. Um, so the muzzle loading world got a bad rap for a long time um, just because the propellant was so dirty. Uh, but today, we uh, the number one powder that I use uh, in pretty much every occasion uh, is a product called Blackhorn 209. Um, we don't have any affiliation with them other than they just make really good uh, black powder propellant. Um, and uh, it doesn't have sulfur in it. Uh, it's not hydroscopic, uh, so it doesn't absorb moisture. Uh, that's one of the big problems that guys that hunted with a black powder gun over the years faced and fought 
during deer season was rain, snow, inclement weather, uh, uh, high moisture in the air, especially if you're in the south with all the humidity we have. Uh, the new powder Blackhorn 209 does not have any of those weak qualities. Um, but the number one thing to, to understand about hunting with a muzzleloader is consistency means everything. Um, and what I mean by that is, is once you figure out what your gun likes, you have to do the exact same thing repetitively, repetitively all the time. Um, so if, you're, if your gun likes 110 grains of Blackhorn 209, um, you always want to run that, run the same bullet, uh, have the same cleanliness of the barrel every time you shoot it. Um, I know there's a lot of talk out there, um, whether you swab the bore after every shot or you shoot it five times, then you clean it. Uh, some guys say they don't never clean it. Um, but again, it's about consistency. And the only way that you can have consistency in a muzzleloader, which in turn means accuracy, is swabbing the bore with a damp patch and a dry patch after every shot. And I know there's probably folks listening now that goes, oh my goodness, you mean I got to clean the barrel twice every time I pull the trigger? Um, yes, you do. <laughs> uh, no way around it. Um, but once you do it a time or two, it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, the bark is a bit worse than the bite on that. It just comes repetitive motion shoot it, swab the bore, shoot it, swab the bore. It becomes pretty easy after a couple times. Um, but that is consistency. A consistent clean barrel every time you squeeze the trigger means consistent muzzle velocity, which means consistent downrange accuracy. Yeah, and that's just the, I wouldn't necessarily say the price to pay, but I mean, that's just the, what's necessary in order to make sure that it's working, you know, consistently, like you were saying, and making sure that it's going to continue to work for you in the future. That's just something that's got to be done, just like cars need maintenance and, you know, whatever else. I mean, there's, there's different things. These are, these are machines. They're, they're, they have mechanisms inside of them that make them operate. And those mechanisms need to make sure that, you know, they're, have an opportunity to continue to work. Yeah. You know, it's just no different than, a, uh, an archer, uh, an archer. Uh, if he's a bow hunter, man, he goes out and practices, uh, all through the summer shooting targets that way that he can, uh, maintain his proper, uh, grip position on the riser, uh, that way that he can, uh, gather muscle memory. So when he draws back his bow, he doesn't have to think about where he's going to knock, uh, his release, uh, or anchor his release on the side of his face. Um, uh, it, that is repetitive and consistent. And that's the same thing with these muzzleloaders. It's about consistency and doing the same thing every time uh, to make them really be accurate. And and again, years ago, it was 75 yards was our accuracy threshold. And now we're talking 400 yards guaranteed. And, and, and I don't feel, um, I, I don't feel even a problem shooting mine at 700. It's just the technology is there. And if you do, the right thing and it's consistent of how you load and take care of it those muzzle loaders on the market today will treat you extremely well yeah definitely definitely and one of the other things i really liked about cva you know looking at throughout the the website and that kind of thing is that these muzzle loaders i mean when you compare these to rifles of other man manufacturers and that kind of thing they are really affordable like even at the full price they are affordable guns and they're really nice they look great so that's something that is just incredible that CVA has been able to put a product out that's able to do the things that you've kind of mentioned here and also be able to do it with people that have a wide range of budgets. You know, and that is one thing that we've kind of always um, strive to be is, is basically the blue collar Americans gun of choice. Um, uh, our wolf line and muzzleloader starts around 200 to $250, depending on if you get camo or black. Uh, all the way through the lineup up to the Paramount Pro, which is $1,600 retail. Um, and I know that sounds expensive, um, but there's other companies out there that have bolt action muzzleloaders also. Uh, one just released one that is based out of Wyoming. They released it about three weeks ago. It's very comparable to our Paramount Pro, and its sticker shock is $8,000. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the Paramount Pro being $1,600, yes, is a lot of money, but that's a whole lot of gun for that dollar. Uh, but, but please, when you're listening to this, if you're new to muzzleloading, do not think you have to get a $1,600 muzzleloader to go take part in 
that black powder season or primitive weapon season um, in your state. Um, the wolf that we manufacture, again, a break open muzzleloader for $250 is a very good muzzleloader, is very accurate. Um, I have wolves that I've shot out accurately out to 300 yards. Um, uh, again, I'm pretty picky about how I do it and I'm very consistent about uh, everything I do to make it do that. Uh, but nonetheless, for a $250 muzzleloader, the wolf is a fine choice. So don't think you have to go out and spend $1,600 to get in the game. You do not have to do that. Yeah, that's great. That's Thank you for that. I'll definitely make sure that in the show notes of the show, in the details of the show, I'll have the link for the website and as, far, as well as some other information down there. So I got a couple more questions kind of as we're closing down here. This is one that I, I like to ask a lot of my guests, and it's one that I've gotten all kinds of answers from. I didn't really prepare you for this one, so this is going to be one that's uh, it's going to be raw and right here. So, I'm off the <laughs> so my, field, man, send it. <laughs> all right. So my question for you is, what does hunting mean to you? Um, I, I could see where you would get a montage of answers for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, boy, it could go in a hundred different directions, but really, I think at the end of the day, uh, what it means to me is number one, I'm putting food on the table. Uh, that I know where it come from. Uh, I know it's not filled with antibiotics and growth hormones and all the craziness that is on the shelf today in red meat that I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have consumed. Uh, I, I like the ability to be able to go harvest animals, uh, whether it be trophy bucks or slick heads, uh, to be able to take that meat back home to my family uh, so that I know what they're eating is healthy, clean, and, and organic. Um, I think it is a very good place to, to go gather quiet time uh, to look over your life um, uh, and see it a bit clearer uh, when you're in a tree stand, I think. Um, I think those probably, if, if, if I'm going to stick to two, is, is gathering good food uh, and then having a time to reflect on life and see what the man upstairs has done for me. Uh, and maybe get some uh, clearer path of, of how to proceed to the future. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great answer. And I appreciate you sharing that with me. That's, that's awesome. Knocked it out of the park. So <laughs> there we go. But so where can, uh, where can folks, where can they connect with you? Where can they connect with CVA? Where can they check out some of the products and all that kind of thing? Man, you know, so uh, like I said, my nickname has been Traveling Hunter for a long time, and it is country slang, Traveling Hunter. There's no G in traveling. Uh, anywhere on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, my handle is Traveling Hunter. Uh, and then, of course, CVA. All you got to do is hit CVA on any search engine, and we come up all over the place because we are the number one muzzle loader uh, and now bolt action rifle manufacturer in the world and have been for a long time. So through our social media channels, it's CBA or it, it's CBA official uh, through Instagram. All right. Awesome. Like I said, I'll make sure I put all that information down in the show notes. For, so if those of you guys that are listening to this, head down there, click on those links, and you guys will be able to connect with Tony. You guys will be able to connect with CVA right from there. So thank you, Tony, for being on the Rise Kill Eat podcast. This was a really educational conversation i'm so glad we were able to get this uh, figured out and be able to get everything kind of squared away here because this was very educational for me well man I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here more than you know and you guys that are listening to the podcast here currently i appreciate you guys taking time out of your day wherever you might be in a car or on a tractor we appreciate you taking time out of your day to to be a part of this podcast we appreciate you absolutely absolutely it wouldn't be uh much of a conversation if we didn't have listeners so there we go <laughs> <laughs> true statement sir true statement all right guys so there you go there is the very knowledgeable tony smotherman i appreciate you guys listening to the rice Elite podcast today if you guys are interested in any of cva or any of cva's products or if you're interested in reaching out to tony and connecting with him be sure to check out the links and the information down in the show notes down there you're also going to find a, a link to the rice kill Eat podcast page the rice kill Eat podcast is listener supported as of right now so if you guys are finding any value from the rice kill Eat podcast you guys can support this show by making monthly commitments to help support the show to help grow the audio experience and of course being able to help the show grow to be able to get it out into new listeners ears so be sure to check out how you can support the rice kill Eat podcast today also, if you found any value from today's episode, 
I just want to ask that you guys take 15 to 20 seconds to leave a rating and review on the podcast platform that you're listening on. Those ratings and reviews, they play a huge role in being able to organically grow podcast shows. So any positive rating and review that you guys can give, those will, of course, allow the Rice Gilly podcast to continue to grow and potentially reach more and more people. I can't thank you guys enough for all that you guys have done for the Rise Kelly podcast. I'm thankful that I even get to sit in this seat and be able to record this show. And of course, you guys checking it out on a weekly basis. Thank you guys for continuing to be loyal support and be sure to go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. That way you don't miss out on any future episodes of the Rise Kelly podcast. I'll see you guys next week.